So after many hours of blood, sweat and tears, my course on family law is now available. And I think it's really comprehensive in the way that it deals with everything. So covering things not only like marriages and civil partnerships, but what happens when those marriages and civil partnerships break down and what happens to the property and finances of the parties. Also thinking about things like parenthood, so what does legal parenthood mean in the context of UK law, and what does parental responsibility entail in terms of duties and responsibilities. We also think about children in a much wider sense, so the Children Act 1989 is a really difficult act to understand, but we deal with complicated issues like the Section 8 orders across a series of lectures so that you get a really fundamental understanding. We also deal with some of the standalone topics that might come up as well, so adoption and domestic violence, making sure that you're ready to answer any essay question or problem question that might come up in that area. I really think it's very good in terms of sort of providing you with enough detail. A lot of revision guides that you might buy are, tend to sort of skimp on some of the key cases um, or some of the key statute laws so that you're missing out. But I really think that there's everything in this course that you would need to get a first class mark. So there's a full list of the contents below, as well as a link where you can find the course and make the purchase. Um, but as always, when we do these things, I often start with an introduction and a sample. So we're going to be looking in this lecture on divorce. So let's get started with that. In the first of this mini series on divorce and the effect that that has on property and finances between a married couple, we're actually going to begin by considering the remedies that are available. And that's a little bit unusual because in most areas of the law, remedies are the last thing that you would deal with after the judge has already made their decision. However, I think there's a couple of reasons why it's useful to consider remedies first here. Firstly, it introduces you to the idea that the courts have a great degree of flexibility when it comes to remedies, and that's a common theme that we'll see throughout this mini-series, the court's flexibility. Now, in some ways, that's a very good thing because the flexibility allows the courts to adopt, adapt their answers to the circumstances of any particular case. So it doesn't matter if it's a big money case between a really high powered husband and wife or a normal high street divorce, the courts can alter their solutions according to the facts of any particular case. However, for you as a law student, that flexibility is not necessarily a good thing because it means that there isn't any sort of hard and fast rule that's available. And so you need to also be able to take a flexible approach when it comes to answering essay and problem questions. The second reason we're starting with remedies as well is because when we're thinking about the substance of a case itself, in other words, the factors that the court will consider upon the breakdown of a marriage, it's always useful to have in the back of your mind what the remedies that the court might be thinking about, depending as those facts and circumstances change. Say, for example, in a problem scenario, how does the having of children affect a particular court's decision and the remedies that are going to be available? So with that in mind, let's get started with the remedies available and in particular the statute law. When it comes to these lectures on divorce and distribution, the main thing that we're going to be looking at and the main statute we're going to be looking at is the Matrimonial Causes Act 1973 and in particular part two. So if you see a reference to a section of an act, then you can assume that that's the Matrimonial Causes Act, uh, unless I say otherwise. So we're starting off with section 25 of that act. And as we talked about a minute ago, this really talks about the flexibility of the court. But on the other hand, it does emphasize that their main concern is going to be the welfare of any children. That makes a lot of sense, really, because children not able to really look after their own interests, and so it's up to the court to do so instead. Section 25.2 talks about a list of relevant factors when we're thinking about dividing up property and finances, and we'll consider those in the next lecture in this series. Um, but for now, we're just going to focus on the remedies. Section 25a talks about the discretion of the court to order a clean break. Essentially, what we're talking about when we talk about a clean break is allowing the parties to move past their marriage and set up their own independent lives. So instead of one party having to pay the other party over a period of say 10 or 20 years, they're trying to sort of get the marriage done and over with 
as soon as they can so that the parties can move on and if they want to say remarry or cohabit as part of another relationship essentially that clean break principle is one we're going to come back to during this lecture um, and try and emphasize it more so to go into a little bit more detail section 25a1 really steers the court towards the idea of creating a clean separation between the two parties where it's just unreasonable to do so and that's an important caveat here because often when there are children involved in the marriage it's not really going to be possible to create the clean break um, as quickly as they would like because there is going to be this issue of the child and how the child is going to be maintained and looked after in the intervening period so what in, what we have instead is the idea of a deferred clean break and this may essentially say that the courts are going to aim for the clean break once the child say achieves the age of 18 and is no longer a child so we're going to have payments for a period of time because it's obviously dependent on the children being looked after um, but that's going to end at a certain point and then we will have the clean break so in order to do this the courts are going to have to look at the marriage itself consider the factors such as the children and look at uh, different things which are under the case of G and G from 2012 and this essentially lists eight factors that we need to actually look into account when trying to create this clean break um, and so the first thing that we're talking about is the lifestyle enjoyed during the marriage and this sets like a basic level for how the marriage should be considered and what we're looking for when we achieve a clean break so for example in big money cases as they're so called when there's often millions of pounds at stake then there's going to be generally a higher lifestyle enjoyed by the parties because they simply have more money this is going to be compared with your sort of bog standard average case of sort of the middle class where there's maybe thousands of pounds at stake rather than millions and so there's going to be a sort of lower standard of living that's going to have to be maintained the length of the marriage is also relevant and kind of feeds into this as well because say for example you marry up and all of a sudden you move from a relatively modest lifestyle but then you go to sort of a much more richer lifestyle where you sort of have a nicer house a nicer car that sort of thing well if it's only a short marriage and ends after a short amount of time uh, then you probably get the court is probably going to accept that you're going to move down back to the standard of living that you were used to before the marriage however if your marriage lasted say 20 or 30 years then you probably get used to the higher lifestyle and so the court will take that into account the other thing that they're really looking into is any needs or disadvantages generated during the marriage so for, uh, perhaps for example one of the parties becomes ill during that time or well, the most common need that we're going to see is in point E and this is childcare which we sort of already talked a, bit, a little bit about now that's going to be represented by a continuing financial contribution to the childcare and so we're going to sort of have maintenance payments in relation to the child themselves now choices in relation to childcare are also going to be a relevant factor and that kind of draws us full circle because it comes back to the lifestyle enjoyed say for example the um, child is used to quite a privileged upbringing where they maybe go on ski trips have music lessons go to a private school and um, then that's going to be something that needs to be taken into account by the court when considering those maintenance payments and also how long they go on for so that links generally back to the provisions in 25a another important case that, um, in this area was mills and mills from 2018 this was covered in a podcast episode on the podcast UK Law Weekly um, so make sure that you check out that episode really to do with an idea that was popularised in the media about a meal ticket for life in other words spouses who are trying to take advantage and essentially not have to work for the rest of their lives and instead become dependent on these maintenance payments now obviously the maintenance payments can be essential in a number of cases so it's maybe not fair to look at it like that um, and there is an opportunity for the maintenance payments to be extended where they need to be say for example one of the children becomes ill and is no longer able to become independent at the age of 18 
it may be necessary to go back to the courts and extend the period for which the maintenance is paid and that's available under uh, Waterman and Waterman although that is a restricted right under section 28.1a so while the periods can be extended there has to be a good reason for them to do so. So what about the powers of the court themselves? What really are the remedies that are available in these types of cases? Well the first one that we're talking about is maintenance pending suit. This is really just a short term thing before the court makes a final order. It's available under section 22 and essentially covers any needs or um, immediate financial interests of the parties before the case is finally decided, in particular focusing on needs of the children during that time. And so it's a temporary solution to the problem um, while the case is dragging on, because sometimes they can take months or years to resolve. Section 22ZA is an interesting addition to this because it basically deals with legal aid, which is quite a hot political subject recently. And so now we have the opportunity to use legal services payment orders which is essentially where one of the parties is not able to afford their legal fees and so they can be paid under section 22ZA. Meanwhile we also have periodical payment orders can be made in favour of a spouse or a child under section 23 and as the name suggests they're basically payments that are made during a particular period um, on a regular basis so for example it would just be X amount of pounds are paid um, over Y number of years um, or months uh, for the next five years, something like that. So it might be, say, a thousand pounds a month for the next six years, something like that. So that amount can be varied upwards at any stage in order to meet any particular needs. Um, and if there isn't an end point that's set by the court, then the payments are going to end on the death of either of the parties or if the person who is getting paid, also known as the payee, remarries, and that's covered under section 28.1a. Secured periodical payment orders, pretty much the same thing, and they're quite rare now, but under section 23.1b, the periodical payments can be secured against a particular piece of property. And so if the person who is actually paying defaults on their periodical payments, or if they should die, then the property can simply be transferred to the payee in order to ensure that they get their money and they don't lose out. Um, on the other hand, the property can then revert back to the payer if the payee again dies or decides to remarry. That, that's covered under section 28.1b. Lump sums are a, a really important and useful way of achieving a clean break, which, as we said at the start, really one of the key ideas that the court is going to be focused on during any particular case. Essentially all we're doing here is providing a lump sum of money in order to ensure that the case goes away, it ends, it creates the clean break and the parties can just do their own thing. Now it can potentially be an instalment but where is something like periodical payments which are also kind of in instalments the periodical payments are more about sort of securing um, maintenance for a child. Meanwhile, the lump sum instalments are trying to achieve the clean break as soon as possible. However, if there's children involved, then that's not going to be appropriate. And also there might not be enough money involved in the marriage in order to be able to ensure the lump sum. So the lump sum can be used to, um, uh, is based on the idea of the Duxbury formula. Um, you see, this is used by family lawyers. You don't really need to be able to work out the formula itself. It's based on very complicated tables, but essentially the lump sum that would have to be paid in any particular marriage after it ends is based on a range of factors, including life expectancy. Obviously, uh, if you're younger, then you'd have to pay more towards the lump sum. Also based on inflation and interest rates. So there's a little bit of variation there, but at least there is a mathematical formula used for working out the fair amount. Now we can move on to the property as well and these can be adjusted under section 24. Often when we're thinking about property it's just in relation to homes but can also relate to cars and investments, different things like that. And if the court decides that to vary the ownership, say for example it was bought, a piece of property was bought at 50-50 
and the court adjusts it to 75.25, and then that's not going to be varied later at a subsequent date, as we can do with things like the periodical payment orders. So section 24.1a allows the property to be settled for other parties, such as the children of the marriage. Where the property is not adjusted by the court, it can actually be sold through the power of sale. And this is a really flexible remedy that's available under section 24a, it can be used in conjunction with a lump sum payment. So you can imagine that in most marriages, there's only going to be sort of a thousand pounds or so of capital between the husband and the wife at any particular time. The reason for that is just they're, you know, sort of trying to get by. And most of their capital is actually going to be tied up in the matrimonial home. Now, in the case of a childless marriage where both parties are looking to move on, that matrimonial home can be sold by the court and then um, the proceeds distributed between the parties in order to ensure that there is enough money there to create the lump sum payment. So you can see how the flexibility of the remedies really helps in this particular situation and how they can be used in a creative way to uh, establish solutions between the parties. The court can even in these types of cases under section 24A6 order that the property is offered to sell to one of the parties and really the reason behind this is that it stops the party who has the uh, pr property to sell and um, it stops them being able to sort of sell it at a lower price and reduce the amount of capital that's available as part of the marriage um, and basically would also allow one of the parties to remain in the matrimonial home if it is their particular desire or even um, need to do so. Related to these property orders, we also have Misha orders, deriving from the case of Misha and Misha from 1980. Basically allows one of the parties to remain in occupation of the family home while the other retains an interest. So you can imagine in situations where the matrimonial home is owned 50-50 between the husband and the wife. However, the wife might be the primary caregiver. She wants to remain in occupation after the marriage ends and so she would be able to do so under a Misha order. However, say there is a child who is going to be 18 in about three or four years time, then the court may decide that the property should then be sold once the child leaves home and is able to establish their own independence. At that point, once the property is sold, the proceeds can be split accordingly. However, these Misha orders are not really as popular. They essentially fail to produce the clean break, and it's not always going to be easy for one of the occupying parties to relocate after the property is sold. We saw that in the case of Clutton and Clutton. That case was much more to do with a Martin order, um, which we're going to look at now, but the same principle sort of applies there as well. So in these ca cases, it's going to be necessary for one of the parties to again continue to occupy the family home for the rest of their life. Um, you can imagine the type of situation, perhaps one of the parties has a terminal disease and it's not going to really be very convenient or fair for them to move out of the family home. And so they would be able to continue living there for the rest of their life. Once the, uh, part, that party has died, then the property would then simply revert back to the other party and they will be able to take ownership. However, um, the other party is also going to be able to gain their share back if, say, the party who remains in the home um, either remarries or they cohabit as part of a new relationship. So it's not just those sort of terminal illnesses. Maybe that was not the most illustrative example. It can still be used in cases where there is a child. But again, these orders may be not as popular as they used to be because it's not really establishing the clean break that we're looking for under Section 25A. Finally, we can also look at undertakings, and I've put these here, they're perhaps not the um, best example of a court order because they're only sort of slightly related, but it does fall under the available remedies and the way that this can sort of be resolved, so that's why it's here. Essentially, undertakings, as the name suggests, is a promise from one party to the other, and so that's not really a court order because they're in relation to things that a court doesn't have the power to order. So the example that I've put there is one of making mortgage payments. In the case of Gandolfo, we have the paying of school fees. 
and this is the promise that one party will pay the mortgage payments or pay the school fees. And although that's not an order from the court, because it's an official undertaking, um, it can be enforced by the courts. And so that was seen in the case of Livesey and Jenkins from 1985. And so hopefully that gives you an idea about the powers that the courts have in relation to divorce and the division of property and finances. Now, as we talked about at the very start of this lecture, there is a great degree of flexibility involved here. And this allows for a number of creative solutions. And you should be thinking in the same way when it comes to, say, for example, a problem question. So while we have to look at what we, the court can do in relation to a piece of property, for example, that can also link back in to the power of sale and the creation of a lump sum in order to create a clean break. And that clean break principle as well, while we think about it, is really important. A foundational principle of modern divorce law, essentially allowing the parties to get on with their own independent lives. And so that's definitely one of the starting points that you should have although obviously that can be mitigated by the effects of a children to the marriage. Right, I'll be back next time with another lecture on divorce and how we're dividing up property, but for now, bye!